Hey guys, today I am talking with John Parker. John is a personal trainer out of San Diego, California, and he is a certified Strong First Elite instructor, and he's super strong. This is a really fun conversation uh, with a great trainer uh, about strength, minimum effective doses that you need to be strong, and not chasing standards. I think you're really going to enjoy this show. Pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. John, can you give a little bit about your of your background for the listeners? Absolutely. So I've been personal training professionally for about 15 years. I'm a certified strength and conditioning specialist, strong first elite. I got the beast tamer at the end of January. Very happy with that. I'm also a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. So I've always been very interested in the whole picture, the holistic health model. So with the FDNP certification, I get a little bit deeper with some of my clients as far as some lab testing, getting into some blood work, supplements, and everything in between, the nutrition, the lifestyle. I, I really like the full picture for myself and for all my clients. Awesome. So this is, might sound like a silly question, but just in case, what is the Beast Tamer Challenge? The Beast Tamer, the Beast Tamer and Iron Maiden. It is an old challenge from the RKC and Strong First currently. For men, it is a strict military press and a strict pull-up and a strict pistol squat, all with a 48 kilo kettlebell, AKA the Beast. And the female equivalent is the Iron Maiden Challenge. The same lifts, the military press pull up in the pistol squat with a 24 kilo kettlebell. So the list is short of everyone who's achieved it. Uh, it was a lot of training to get there. Very happy to have marked that off and to move on with my life. So no, that's, that's awesome. So uh, for the listeners, a 48 K bell is a 106 pound kettlebell. That's quite large and can be awkward to hold. And you did a one-legged squat. Mm -hmm. but the calves with holding that bell mm -hmm. and a press and a pull-up with an extra, almost like an extra body uh, attached to your body while you were doing a pull-up. Pretty much. That's pretty awesome. Feels good. It feels good. I, I think once you prime your body with the, the proper training, I think the particulars of doing a challenge like that were unknown to me at the time, but I had an inkling after just figuring things out over the past 23 years of lifting that if I just did my program and I did nothing else that my body would recover enough for me to actually get stronger. And I think that has been the theme of my life over the past five years. All right. So, all right. Well, how, how did, I have a question I want to ask you, but before I do, I have a bigger question. Mm -hmm. What got you started into, into training or how, you know, what brought you into the fitness world? Yeah, so fitness, you know, I don't think I've known anything but fitness and sports athletics since I was very young. I ran track and field all my life and went to the University of California, San Diego to continue in track and field. By that point, I was pretty burnt out. So I quit track. Thankfully, I had always been lifting for football and for track and field probably since the end of middle school. So instead of track and field, I got really serious into the weight room and figured I would be a coach at some point. My degree is in history and Spanish literature. And <laughs> the, those are, they're still interests of mine for sure. I'm a big history buff, but also very, very into the training. So I went down that pathway and have never looked back. It was the right decision for me to get into the industry. And I still feel pretty lucky that I get to show up every single day and I get paid really, really well, basically just to supervise workouts. So it's a pretty good job. Uh, I will. I'm sure you do more than supervise workouts. Um, I've seen, so I've seen your Instagram post. What in track and field, what were your events? The 100 meter and long jump primarily. Right on. So you were not a thrower, you were a speedster. Yeah, speedster. I always liked all the throwing events too, but you know, in high school we had to pick four. So triple jump, long jump, hundred meter, and the four by one for me. Um, I I have a big interest though. I our mutual friend John Odin. I mean, he's a thrower and shot put, discus, all that stuff is a lot of fun. You're kind of cut from the same cloth as far as being a power athlete. It's a really interesting sport because track and field is so diverse. You have the guys and the girls who are really heavy on type one muscle fibers is slow twitch. And then the complete opposite where it's all fast twitch. And I tell some of my, my current clients, like my teenage clients who are in track and field that 
when I was sprinting, we might run half a mile per practice. We're not running very much, but it's very, very high intensity. So it's interesting how genetics and then the training play into what sport that you play and what you, your body is made to excel at. So you do, do you think then that there it's certainly with some bodies that are suited well for certain sports? I absolutely think that I, I'm sure like you, I, I can kind of tell in the very beginning, I'll have a lot of my clients. I end up training their kids as well, especially if they're athletes. And you can kind of tell what they're going to be good at, or if they're going to be an elite athlete, or maybe just going to be recreational, nothing wrong with that. But yeah, I think there really is a genetic component to a lot of this. And even if you think of just the specialization of finding a, a guy who's six, eight, and he weighs 300 pounds, and he's fast, it's like, he's going to be a football player. There's just no way around it. it. You have to be born like that to, to really excel and then make it into the NFL, for instance, or with a lot of these sprinters, they were just always fast, always muscular, always super, super strong. And I think a lot of that is born, but you do need to train it with the genetics. It still requires a really diligent work ethic to get to the higher levels of competition. So you need more than talent. I think you need more than talent. Yeah. I think you need work ethic too, because right talent, on. talent only gets you so far. We've all seen that. So you said that you had a theme for the past five years um, in your training uh, journey. Uh, have you, have you ever overtrained? Yes, I definitely have. I think someone like me with a very addictive personality more was definitely better for most of my career. And having so many hobbies that you want to do that were physical, rock climbing, uh, scrambling in the mountains, lifting weights, shooting the bow, running, all of this stuff, you can't do it all. You really have to, to pick. Back in 2017, I had a goal of pulling a triple body weight deadlift, and that was 500 pounds exactly. I weigh 100. I weighed back then 167 pounds, and I found a good program that was suited to me. It was basically lifting heavy twice a week. At that point, I had been climbing a lot. I had been running at the same time, as well as working full time with all my clients. So you know that can be rough on the body if you're not well rested. Anyway, I got the 500 pound deadlift. And after that, it was just a cascade downhill. And I really knew I was burnt out because I had zero motivation to be in the gym. Every time I saw someone picking up a barbell or doing a cer certain lift, something lit up in my brain saying, don't do that. That doesn't feel good. And I knew, uh oh, something's wrong because I didn't want to be in the gym anymore. I didn't want to train. And my story is recovering out of that. So getting a little bit deeper, at the same time, I was becoming more interested in the functional lab testing, especially looking at the adrenals, looking at the hormones, uh, all the sex hormones and how they interrelated. So I ended up running a test called a Dutch test. It's a dried urine test for comprehensive hormones is what that acronym is for. Basically a Dutch test, you pee on four strips, okay, throughout the day. So you start at night in the evening. You take one in the evening, one before bed, one upon waking, and one in the mid-morning. What this does is it captures all of your cortisol. The cortisol in your body has a very natural rhythm where it's high in the morning and throughout the day it goes down. Now, when it goes down, we should be getting sleepy and that's when melatonin rises. That would be a good cortisol rhythm. But you can tell a lot of people super stressed and they might have acute stress where their cortisol is elevated, maybe like midday or in the afternoon or at night and they can't sleep. If this goes on for long enough, eventually the cortisol come, becomes depleted. And when I looked at my graph on my Dutch test, it should have been a nice high mark in the morning down at night. It was completely rock bottom. So this is colloquially known as Adrenal fatigue, it's not really an adrenal fatigue. It's a product of the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the adrenal axis not functioning properly. So the test showed I was completely burnt out. Testosterone was not where it should be. Uh, makes a lot of sense because my motivation had gone down so low. Thankfully being, how old was I? Five years ago, so about 31, 32, thankfully young enough to bounce back from that. My DHEA, uh, the mother of my sex hormones, was high enough to kind of counteract this low cortisol, but that's where I really needed to 
redefine my philosophy and my own self-love and not see my my own self-respect or my self-worth based on my accomplishments in the weight room because it became like this drug where I wanted more, more, more. And the more I, I wanted, the more I took, and then the more depleted I became. So a little bit of my story right there. And it's, it's really fun to talk about it now because I'm on the other side, but during a moment like that, and when I see athletes currently going through that, it can be really scary because it's your whole self-identity and you're like, I'm never going to be able to do what I love again. And, and that's a big problem. Uh, that's awesome. Um, so let me ask you, you, you talked about coming to love yourself and, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, but it seems like you, you decided that you were more than a number. I would say so. How, like, so what was that process? Like, what, like, was there an internal dialogue? Like, how did you come to that? Because I think a lot of times people chase like standards that were made by somebody else. That's not them. That doesn't care about them, but like you, and you've, you've, you've heard all this before, but like, you know, if you're, if you're going to be considered strong, you need to be able to lift X times your body weight in this lift and X times your body weight in that lift. If, if we're going to call you know, if, if you are designated or blessed as being strong. Um, but those are all just made up standards and they really don't determine a person's self-worth, but yet you can get caught in that net of, or that trap of that does become your identity, or you're always reaching for something that you think you're not when you already are. So I'm, I've talked way too much. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? I agree completely. I, I think actually your definition of that, that you're living to someone else's standards, that becomes a problem because that's what we do too much with social media now and the current landscape of, of, of being where so many people are depressed and they're not living a fulfilling life. I think ultimately I realized that I had been blessed with a lot of gifts as far as what my body was able to do. But I really think that my purpose in, on this earth is to teach other people and that I had to go with the fact that, hey, I went to the extreme and I accomplished this, but was it worth it? And, you know, I might say it was worth it just because I was able to figure out a way to bounce back and now teach other people that lesson. And we both know not everyone can learn from someone else. Sometimes they have to make that mistake for themselves. But when I caution my, either my clients or my colleagues or people I know who are first responders, it's coming from a place where they can respect me because I've probably accomplished maybe a goal they're going toward and giving them a better direction, a better light of how to get there. I, I think it was valuable because of that. And also less about the numbers and more about the beauty of lifting for lifting sake, as far as I'm really into kettlebells and barbells, body weight, all that stuff, but just getting closer to, you'll never get to perfection, but making your movement so crisp, making them look easy, making it fun, making it your own art, that became more of my passion. Um, in the lifting arena. And lo and behold, did that long enough and kind of trained sub maximally to a point where my body had recovered enough to uh, start being more receptive to lifting heavier. And just this year at age 36, I've set probably four PRs in my strength and learning, awesome. learning how to recover has really been it and not overdoing it. And I got a 3.2 times body weight. It was a trap bar, but I got 550 pounds in the trap bar at, I think I was 170 pounds that day. And then obviously- That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it felt good. It felt really easy too. I mean, it really just goes back to, if I lift three days a week, that's probably going to be enough. And you have to, to figure out what's going to work for you. But I just see so many athletes and, and so many military personnel here in San Diego and just more, 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 more. And I know I'm prone to that mentality that more is better. But when I step back and I actually did the work of thinking, okay, maybe there's a little bit more beauty in being minimal and doing just enough. I couldn't believe the results that I got. I couldn't believe that I got leaner. I got more muscular. My body actually felt good. And when my body felt good, I slept better. And because I slept better, my hormones were better. And then my gains were off the chart. I was doing way too much and it broke me. So I'm a big believer in, you know, just kind of doing enough to get by, but doing it very, very well, making it your art. And 
you'll get stronger, you'll get better, you'll get more flexible, whatever it is you're going for. So by doing less, a lot less, you got bigger, bigger, better, faster, stronger, leaner, healthier, happier. I would say so. Now, there's always a caveat with this stuff. I, I know maybe a lot of people listening to this podcast, they're, they're probably enthusiasts in, in one way or another. And I do believe in, in providing a stimulus. It really depends on your training age. And the training age is how long you've been training, what your experience is. And you know, some people might need to start with that classic three by 10 on like a dumbbell bench press and some rows. There's nothing wrong with that. I train a lot of my clients that way and they're very happy. But once you get a little bit more refined and you're doing a lot more technique work, let's say it's with kettlebells or barbells and you have a moderately, you know, good press or back squat, you can get away with more minimal stuff and higher intensity. So I believe the minimal stuff works if you're able to load it with enough intensity for it to matter, but you don't need to overdo it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so basically they have to honor where they're at, start where they're at, but also cry, create a stimulus. That's a challenge for their body so that their body can meet the challenge so that there's growth. Absolutely. And that requires some discipline. It's definitely going to take some time. And I think the beauty is the journey with all of this stuff. And, you know, the, the type of lifting I do, it's not a sport. And it was always tough for me to get my head around that. I'm not competing. Uh, I'm not super into competition at this point. I competed my whole life. It's more for me. And again, that focus on the artistry, like how, how pretty can I make it? How good can I feel? How mobile can I get and, and still be super strong, super powerful and go throughout the rest of my day with high energy so I can give that to other people. That's really the, the goal at this point. That's, that's a worthy, a worthy goal. In all of this, because you mentioned nutrition earlier, how does, how important is nutrition or how does nutrition play a role in helping a person achieve their best self or uh, when they're trying to apply that minimum dose or even let's say they're trying to get over um, overtraining. Maybe they do have adrenal fatigue. How, how does nutrition play a role into all of that? You know, I, I don't think you can divorce nutrition from anything. And I think it's, it's almost a fool's errand to try to do that because as beings, as animals on this earth, we have to eat. There's just no way around that. And we have to make these decisions often. And I think you can apply this minimalism philosophy to the foods you eat. And I think, okay, yeah, you can have some variety in there, but having proper protein just to get the, these amino acids so your body can actually repair and so that your liver can function properly, very, very important. You know, with a lot of this adrenal stuff, the liver is going to be very, very important for your phase one, phase two detoxification. So getting rid of excess estrogen that people may have. There are a lot of foods that can help out with this and a lot of supplements. So I, I'm a big fan of coaching nutrition, but I think it's really challenging because someone has to really want to change. I think with all of this, just to be super simple, I mean, if someone's just eating whole foods, it's going to be really, really tough to, to be obese and to not gain muscle. I'm a big fan of really high quality meat. And if you can tolerate veggies, great. Fruit's very good because it's easy to digest. And fatty fruits like avocado and olives, this stuff is, is all good and it feels very natural to consume. So again, I don't think you can divorce yourself from it. I think if you are an athlete with high performance goals, the biggest thing that I see, or if you want better body composition, my biggest takeaway is that people do not eat enough food and it requires a lot of fuel to gain muscle, to be strong. And that's the hard part. The lifting, I think is the easy part, the exercise, the easy part, but getting your head around what proper nutrition should be and kind of dropping maybe your perceptions of nutrition or what your grandmother used to feed you. That is the tough work that uh, I think people need to you know, do the self work to figure out what it is that's fueling them. And I'm hoping those are actual real foods that we as humans should be eating. No, that's, that's great. Like I've working with people and just, you know, being a person myself, it's, it always seems easier to pe people will go, they'll go work out or they'll, they'll, do that they'll pour themselves into that more or before they'll pour themselves into their nutrition. 
it's like nutrition is always that that last thing or the one thing that you, they don't want to mess with or they don't maybe they don't even have the energy to mess with it mm -hmm. and that could be tough in the beginning and uh, i don't think everyone has the time to do it i, I totally understand that i i'm probably in the kitchen three or four times a day cooking uh for for me and my girlfriend but that's one of our our things that we highly highly value i I'm pretty crazy about it. I purchased a cow back in October with a couple of my friends and, you know, had about 300 pounds of meat in my freezer at all times. And it's something I really value having this stuff on hand. And I think it's very, very important. Awesome. So you like kettlebells? I like kettlebells. Yeah. You recently, uh, you've put together a kettlebell, uh, training program. Can you, for, for OSI online. Can you tell me about, about that and who's it for and what you can expect? Yes. I'm very, very excited about it. I've been working on this for a long time. And I think you and I have just discussed the backstory behind it. Now, back when I had this HPA axis dysfunction, you know, AKA adrenal fatigue, my hormones were completely shot. My motivation was gone. I had recommendations from some of my functional friends to, hey, take it really easy. You got to do walking. You got to do yoga, Pilates. The walking's fine. I always loved hiking. That's that's great. But I, I'm not a big yoga or Pilates guy. It's just not what I'm into. So I decided I need to maintain my muscle mass and I needed to make sure I have an anabolic stimulus to heal myself from this. I can, I can do nutrition and the supplements, but I still need to train. So I decided to do two training sessions per week both based on uh, level one, level two standards for a guy my size, double 24 kilogram kettlebells. And I started ex experimenting with very, very basic kettlebell chains and kettlebell complexes. Now, a chain is performing a sequence of movements, and that might be like a double clean, a press, and a squat, and just doing one of them. Now, a complex would be something like, hey, I'm going to do two cleans, two presses, and two squats all in the same sequence. So I did really, really basic stuff. I would do maybe five sets, five sets of five, something super simple like that, maybe five sets of 10 pull-ups, and then I'd call it a day. The very, very minimum I could do. So what is that total? Maybe 10 sets. The old me was doing about 30 sets per workout, all wow. there all very, very heavy exercises. I mean, it's a hard lesson I had to learn. Now, doing these very minimal workouts, hiking on the weekends for a period of two, three, four, five, six months. And I noticed that my body was feeling really, really good to the point where I was putting on muscle mass again and I was recovered and my motivation was higher to do that the first and the second workout per week because I had just recovered for the first time in my life. Like I wasn't sore. I had been chronically sore for like 15 years and it it's always makes normal. <laughs> yeah. It, it makes me, it makes me laugh when I'll, I'll get clients and I'll train people for years. And they're like, no, I really like being sore. And like, I'll hear that. And I'm like, that's how I used to feel until I stopped like being sore. Cause I was sore 15 years straight and, you know, couldn't sit down on the toilet, you know, without your legs cramping. And for the first time in my life, I'm doing these kettlebell chains and I wasn't destroyed and it felt really, really good. So the program for OSI online is called MED, Minimum Effective Dose Kettlebell Chains. And it's, it's a, a really cool workout. I, I want to say, I want to say that it's simple, but really not easy based on the people I've had test it for me and some of my clients, but that's the whole point. What you want to do is you want to become really proficient in each movement. And yeah, it's going to challenge you, but you're probably not going above five reps in the entire program. And I just ask people do two training sessions a week, and that's going to be eight per month. And you're gradually increasing the volume until you get to a point where then you can either bell up and use heavier bells and the volume drops back down. Or if you're doing it in a period where you're traveling a lot, or let's say you are playing a sport or you're training for a half marathon, it is perform the two kettlebell sessions a week, and it is the minimum that you have to do to maintain. But my thought with most people is that they're really going to grow from these movements and they're going to have a lot of fun doing it. 
all the training sessions can be completed in about 35 minutes. And I'll tell you, Tim, uh, the old me training 90 minutes to two hours, maybe even twice a day before this whole adrenal fatigue issue. Uh, most of my training sessions are about 30 minutes nowadays, and that includes training for the beast tamer. So it definitely works. You just got to do it. You got to have that mindset. Uh, yeah, I highly recommend that everybody check out your Instagram channel to see that it definitely works. I mean, you're carved out of granite. Um, so, so twice a week on kettlebells. I mean, that's, that's pretty phenomenal. Yeah, feeling good. And yeah, it, it builds the motivation quite a bit. I am just of this mindset that that if you really love something, you have to give it up for a little bit. Just it's an exercise in patience, exercise in discipline. And the two became very exciting. So I'm still doing the two. I, I do the program myself. I cycle through programs. I'm currently doing the program uh, without the lower body session because I'm in a phase right now where I'm doing a lot of trail running with some of my high school clients who are track athletes. So yeah, just a little bit of amending the program. And I encourage everyone who uh, purchases the program to do the same thing. It can be based on your specific needs. So speaking of that person that would purchase it, who, who do you think is the ideal person for the program? You know, I, I have kind of like a, a mixed demographic. I think it, it's important to anyone who might be super busy with work, who has to travel a lot, who can do two workouts a week that total less than an hour. I think it's also very good for someone coming off an injury who needs to get back without destroying their body. I think it's also really good for someone who wants to get super strong and powerful they just might choose to use heavier kettlebells and everyone in between. I, I'm really happy with it. I think a lot of times the kettlebells can be kind of scary because there are a lot of form Nazis out there. I encourage everyone to just have fun with it instead. And my goal for people is, hey, make it look crisp, make it look beautiful, film yourself. And I want you to compare it, compare it to me, compare it to your colleagues who are also doing it. Like who can make it look the most beautiful? It should just be about having fun and, and getting super strong. It's a very empowering feeling without the form Nazis. I just, I think it's so counterproductive. So, so you just became one of my favorite people in the world. That was awesome. <laughs> now you're in San Diego. Yes, sir. Right. Do you, do you take distant clients or online clients or virtual clients? Yeah, tr traditionally I have. It was funny during COVID. It was, it was crazy. It was crazy training during the lockdown. Uh, I had my busiest year ever during in 2020. Uh, right now, mostly work with in-person clients. I've been very fortunate to get to a point where it's mostly referral. I work with some high school athletes work with some college athletes, a lot of uh, just, you know, general population, mostly do in-home clientele. Most of my clients have some sort of uh, equipment that we can use, whether it's like a full power rack or just a TRX and kettlebells or anything in between. I, I like training with almost everything. And truth be told, a lot of my clients do not train with kettlebells. They might just have dumbbells, or maybe we have a bar, we have a barbell. Great. We'll play around with that, but you can pretty much use the principles to train anyone with anything. I'm non-discriminatory. Right on. And the reason I was asking was in case you uh, were taking clients, I would to, to get your information for, for those that are listening. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, Instagram is always a good way to, uh, to connect. And my Instagram handles at John Parker, J O H N P A R K E R. And unfortunately the tag was taken, which is my normal name. So there are two underscores after the R in Parker. After the R. After the R. That will be in the notes of the show. And if you're interested in the kettlebell program, the minimum effective dose program, that will be on osi-online.com coming soon to a home near you. John, this has been, uh, man, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Oh, my pleasure. Super nice to meet you finally. And um, I really appreciated listening to your own story recently. That actually helped me come to terms with a lot of the concepts that I have moving forward about what a standard is, what exercise should be, and how we should give ourselves our own self-love in regard to our physical practice and, and everything like that. So thank you. Oh, wow, that's awesome. And it was very great to meet you as well. And I look forward to working with you more. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for listening, everyone. Now get outside and play.